will enable greater international collaborations. And this is the reason why it is important to understand how the world views the dynamic and vibrant Indian film industry. This session is on the global perspective of Indian film industry. And for this, may I please request on stage Mr. Rick Ambrose, international media and entertainment consultant, who will be moderating the panel with eminent speakers like Mr. Killian Kervin, Head of Production, South Asia and Latin America, SK Global Entertainment, Mr. Kevan Mashayek, Chairman, International Committee, Producers, Guild of America, Mr. Martin Rabatz, Director, New Zealand International Film Festival, and Ms. Kyoko Dan, Festival Advisor, Asian Cinema. May I please request everyone to be on the stage, please? The stage is all yours, Rick. Thanks so much, Lancy. And uh, thank you, Film Bazaar and NFPC, for inviting us. We're thrilled to be here. Um, I'm just going to uh, make a few comments to set the stage, and then I will introduce our, our panelists. Um, we uh, all have something to do with India, and I'll want to have more to do with India, which is why I think we're here. Um, just to uh, you know, set the stage a little bit, uh, uh, the, the global box office right now uh, is about $42 billion, um, whereas the United States and North uh, and Canada have about $12 billion of that. China, 10 billion, and India, about 2.4 billion. So as you can see, it's a relatively small number given the amount of films that are produced in this country. Um, and uh, you know, one of the big issues that India has is that it's incredibly underscreened. Uh, India only has between nine and 10,000 movie screens compared to China with over 60,000 and the United States with 40,000. Um, so th that, that's been one issue, I think, uh, uh, in terms of why box office um, hasn't been bigger in this country. Um, and there are just so many films. I mean, uh, somebody mentioned yesterday 2,000 films are produced a year, and I think we have 700 something here in the viewing room. You know, how, how do you find an audience? How do you find a market? We're going to be talking about that. Um, so the good news, though, is uh, revenue earned by Indian movies overseas has tripled in 2017, uh, up to 367 million, up from 125 million in uh, 2016, a year before. Um, so Indian movies are traveling. Um, a lot of that is probably thanks to China, where a lot of Indian movies do extremely well. But um, as I think we're going to talk about, uh, since the storytelling is changing a little bit, new platforms are coming, uh, I think Indian films are going to continue to appeal more and more to a global audience. So I, I think we should all be optimistic. Um, so let me, let me start over here uh, with Killian. Uh, Kelly and I are, are friends and occasional work colleagues. <laughs> um, and um, he works for a company uh, called Ivanhoe Pictures, which is one of the few uh, American companies that are actually investing in India. Um, so, for example, they invested in The Sky is Pink and in several digital series, which Killian can tell you about. Next to him is uh, Kaivan Mashayek, who is a newly appointed uh, co-chairperson of the... Uh, International Committee at the PGA, the Producers Guild of America, uh, which is also uh, really doing a lot of things to try to help uh, Indian film. They also just uh, uh, hooked up, I guess, with the PGI, the Producers Guild of India. He can talk to you about that. Then we have uh, Martin Robarts. Um, he's with the New Zealand Film Festival, um, but he's also spent a lot of time in Holland and really knows his way around these festivals. He was at NFTC uh, a few years ago. Uh, some interesting projects came out of NFTC that he was part of, and he can talk about those. And then we have Kyoko Dan, um, who is an independent consultant and helps uh, take Indian films into difficult markets like Japan, Korea, and, and, and China, um, but is, is able to find an audience there. Um, so let's kick it off um, with some questions here. Um, one of the things India does with its entertainment industry, and you know, China has been trying to do as well, is to export soft power um, in, in the terms of creative content. Um, 
which is sort of the underlying issue uh, in terms of uh, exporting entertainment. Would somebody like to discuss their views on, on a broad political uh, spectrum, how India can uh, continue to improve upon that effort? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Rick. Um, I think that things have changed, certainly, in the last four or five years with the introduction of the OTT platforms is probably the number one um, improvement in, in, in the ability for anybody to, to promote and push their content around the world. Um, for many, many years, people here certainly have been able to see Western films come over and the idea of bringing reciprocally any movies from India or any other country for that matter, it was kind of like the foreign film thing. And for some people embrace that and some people don't, it's a matter of taste. But with the platforms now, language has sort of become agnostic. And I think it started, I think Netflix put Narcos up, which again, for a North American audience that as a rule, I think doesn't like subtitles or didn't like subtitles, the fact that a show was so well received and embraced, and they kind of tricked it. They, they, they did English, a lot of English, the first episodes and seasons that kind of dropped off and became more Spanish and subtitled. And now this, the, the, the content that people consume around the world truly is global, and, and I think we, we, we owe Netflix in particular, but, but a lot of platforms a, a debt of gratitude for that. And not just with the original series, but obviously films that, that that, that are in their libraries, that are local, what we call local language, that now you can pull up anywhere in the world, uh, unless for some reason it's geo-blocked. And I think that just only whets people's appetite for more things. I think we're gonna see a, re, a, a resurgence of theatrical, what we would call foreign films, because people are now going to be more comfortable with going to see, hey, I liked that Indian actor that was on that show that I saw on the platform, and now his or her movie is playing down the street at the, at the multiplex, I might go see that. So I think that there is an opportunity now because it really, certainly in the US, when we looked at, 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 at monetizing and modeling, there would be domestic and foreign where they sort of def define, like, what are we gonna do domestically when we do foreign? And now that's kind of, that model still exists in certain instances, but it really has push, push, been pushed aside because everything's really global now. And I think, so to answer your question in a long way, I think this is, the time is now to push that content out because the, the, the avenues and the channels that are there are going to make it much more easy to, to, to facilitate. And, and Killian, if I may add, to, to, uh, reflective of that is when you look at, there's 16 firms from Disney to Quibi uh, that in this year they're gonna be spending a hundred billion dollars in content creation. That's more than the uh, amount of money that's spent on the American oil industry. This is according to a recent Economist report. And putting that into perspective, in the past decade, uh, Disney, Netflix, and Time Warner, um, they spent 250 billion just in the past decade. So the fact that the acceleration of, of, of spending uh, for this uh, kind of hysteria of content creation and explosion is a testament to where the opportunities are, um, are being uh, cultivated. Can I just add, I think the question about exporting soft culture in the way that China does it is, I, I think there are differences between India's success of exporting cinema than the Chinese model. Um, in my previous work at the I Film Museum in Amsterdam, we were signatories to the Belt and Road Alliance of Film Festivals and Organizations, which is very much a central Chinese government um, plan. It's like a five-year, 10-year plan to export Chinese ideas. And that's what you mean by the export of soft culture, I assume. India doesn't so much have that, that um, game plan. You have studios making Indian stories, and in the commercial sense, they want to export their soft culture because they want money to come back. Um, but I think it's, you can't draw the same sort of analogy with, with, with what China is very strongly working on. Um, and also, I think for the independent space, um, the stories that are being made and sent out into the world go with a different sense of exporting soft culture. I think that the filmmakers I've worked with, there's always been a hope that telling authentic Indian stories will 
open windows and of understanding, like building real cultural bridges with capital C culture so that the very, very shallow perception most Westerners have of this subcontinent can be broken and greater understanding. Like, that's a very artistic point of view, not about the commerce. It's about this is who we are, have a look at us, understand us better, and who are you, which, you know, when Indian people watch foreign cinema. So I think there are three things going on. One, the Chinese model, which is very strategic. One, the Indian model, which in the commercial space is str commercially strategic and doing really well. And the artistic space has a whole other set of, you know, engines that run it. Um, Kyoko, um, so you uh, try to find Indian films that you can take into Asian countries. Um, what's the process? What do you look for? What uh, has worked? What hasn't worked? Okay. Uh, I'm working for the coordination of to sell the Indian films to Japanese distributors and in other Asian countries. And then the, now the market for Indian films are developing in each country. And it's changed after three years. And the same as the other countries. So because uh, everybody, audience think, oh, Indian film is just sing and dance. Everybody, the, all the image for Indian films is just like that, you know, till 2009. And after three years, and they say, oh, Indian films have a subject. And then, the, you know, that subject is very close to, you know, very common to the old Asian people. And that's why and the Asian audience started to watch Indian films and becoming the very familiar to Indian films. And then after that, in Japan, and two years ago, and the Bahubari has a big hit. And then I'm considering why Bahubari, and I, I watched the film at first, oh, this is not for Japanese audience, but, uh, you know, it's a really big hit. So because, uh, you know, Bahubari is like the Japanese comic book. And that's why the Japanese audience can make the manga and the from Bafubari and they enjoyed it a lot. And then, you know, now and that's why and the many you know, Japanese film distributors ask me, do you know any nice Indian films and for Japanese audience? It's, I'm like the free tour call center of the Indian cinema now. And, but, uh, you know, the, almost the same as the other Asian countries, I think. Yeah, I was, I was doing some research with Padman and Baj Bajrangi Bajan, and some of these films have done very well in Japan. Um, I mean, the real phenomenon, of course, is, is, um, is that these films do incredibly well in China. Stories like Dungal and Secret Superstar gross more in China than they do here. Um, so it, 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 it's amazing. Uh, I, I mean, I guess a good story travels, and that's the way it should be. Um, so I'm going to kick it back to you, Martin. Um, they make good stories here at NFDC. Um, you know, as at the open pitch, a lot of interesting concepts. You were working here for a couple of years, uh, involved uh, in, in script development and uh, some of the projects that came out of NFDC. NFDC. Maybe you can uh, discuss a little bit about that. Um, and is it different now than it was when you were here, uh, or is it the mandate the same? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I came to start working with um, the Film Bazaar and the Screenwriters Labs in 2008, so it's been quite a long journey. And it was right at the beginning of a time where India was strategically within the filmmaking community, but also with the support of, at that time, NFDC head Nina Lathgupta, who really had a vision for what needed to happen to return Indian independent cinema to a space that was taken seriously and that was credible in the international marketplace, using first festivals for, as platforms, introducing um, the, un, the, the unsung heroes of the, of the independent world here who have been working under the radar, putting a frame around them by um, uh, really upgrading the things like the Indian Pavilion in Cannes, throwing great parties, which India does better than anybody, and that these, are, these were instruments of getting people to pay attention but also going out and meeting with the key selectors from all of the big A festivals um, and making sure they understand there was a new movement of makers here who are not just doing Bollywood films because for 20 years before that, Indian cinema had been reduced to Bollywood in terms of the Western perception. The, the films had been made, so there was a, a sort of vertically integrated strategy of reaching out, repositioning, um, professionalizing and internationalizing 
the, un the, the working practice of the makers and the producers, um, subsidizing them, taking them to international labs like the Producers Lab in Rotterdam, for example. Um, these were, the, lots of things were happening at the same time. And out of that came, yeah, a really interesting flow of works. Um, it, and at the same time, outside the space that was being created and, and worked on by NFDC, which is what I knew best, there was, you know, the emergence of Anurag Kashyap um, in his own, you know, the force of nature that he is. That was all happening at the same time. Um, and then, of course, came the lunchbox, which was the big breakthrough hit for the independent Indian cinema. At the time it released, it was the biggest non-English language film in the USA and UK. Every um, re emerging or re-emerging industry needs a hit to get people's attention. That tension is there, and I think one of the things that we really focused on after that doing, and I'm, I do see it continuing, is making sure it was not a one-hit wonder industry that the people who saw the lunchbox were looking forward to the next Indian film. Uh, because otherwise they'll start looking at the next, um, you know, Lithuanian film or the next Colombian film because Western audiences are just like goldfish. They go around. If you don't keep feeding them the same flavor, they'll look somewhere else and they'll start eating the Colombian movie. Um, so we had to maintain a flow of really credible work that was being made to a level that was being selected in the big festivals, and that has continued. I mean, I left India several years ago now, um, but I've kept in touch and I see the, the flow of work coming out. But it was, it was well thought through and lots of people were working on it from lots of different angles. Um, and it, it does continue and you see a lot of interesting stuff, as you said, here being presented. So it was um, a sort of a wave was, was pushed out there, lunchbox broke it, and it, it flows on. That's good. Um, so, Kevin, talk a little bit about what you're trying to do uh, at the PGA in terms of India. Well, um, one of the great things about uh, this new uh, the producers, just to give you a little background, the Producers Guild of America is the world's largest trade organization of working film producers in film, television, and multimedia. We have about 8,500 members, and we recently signed a, a memorandum of understanding with uh, the Producers Guild of India to create a super highway of connectivity amongst uh, our producers and the guild with the producers here in India. Uh, because this is a, a very um, early stage development of this uh, agreement that we uh, signed recently, about seven months ago, um, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Kulmit Makar and Vikramjit Roy at Cannes and we instantly hit it off and we decided, hey, let's get this show on the road the right way. and try to find uh, synergies and common denominators amongst uh, our members so that we can really put this into motion. Now, this agreement means a lot to me personally because, uh, you know, as the elected chair of, the, of my committee, uh, I, 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 I'm very, very keen on, on trying to establish relationships that are going to uh, end up developing into something that's very trusting over a period of time. It's not something that is done overnight. It takes time. It needs you to connect with people on a personal level to find out what their needs are, listening and understanding uh, what the, you know, the, 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 the areas where you can converge and connect with. Um, these kind of things, when you're talking about India, if, if you think about it, if I'm an American producer and I'm coming to India for the first time to make a film in a country with 1.37 billion people, where do I start? Where do, who do I go? Who do I talk to? I don't know anybody. I know there's a lot of stories and there's a lot of ways w that I can go about doing it, but in order for you to, to, to uh, get anything going, you have to know the right people. And, and this is the whole thing about trying to filter and find out through uh, these wonderful organizations like the FFO and, and the PGI um, who we can you know, kind of connect and put together into so, so we can uh, create content. So uh, my motto has always been collaborate, create, deliver, and, and that's what we're all about. Um, Killian, how do you decide on which projects to invest in in India? Um, you know, whether it be a film like Sky's Pink or an, uh, an OTT series like Daily Crime. Um, I imagine, you know, the, the, the strategy is primarily to recoup out of the domestic market and do local language content, but if there's a way to then eventually take that project to other markets, uh, that's a bonus and maybe even do a remake. 
Yeah, that's true. Just let me address, you make it sound like we're a financing company, which we obviously are. We have money to invest here in India, but first and foremost, we're a production company and a development company, and we, it's about story, and so the choice, it doesn't start with, oh, this is a, you know, here's an array of investments, we'll take this one because it looks better or worse. We start with the stories we like, the filmmakers that we meet, the producers, the writers, the directors, and what moves us. I mean, we're all here, you know, content creators. It's, you know, you're programming things that move you. You know, you, we're, we're, we're consuming things that we want to, the stories that we want to tell, we're making, and the stories we want to be told, we're watching. And so for us, it starts with the content. Then we get into, okay, I have to take off my sort of creative hat and put on my financer hat because we have investors that we have to answer to and explain why we're making certain financial decisions. And then, yeah, absolutely what you said is true. We are looking for the content we make here in India to work in India. Uh, anything else is a bonus. Uh, we've done theatrical, as you said. The sky is pink, unfortunately, didn't work out as well as we, as, as we would have liked but it was a good choice. We, we were in, in business with some very uh, established and trustworthy and, and wonderful partners, both on the creative side and on the financial and the distribution side. Um, then some of the other choices we make, for instance, Delhi Crime we, we came to us, Richie Mehta was the creator of that, and uh, our partners were just so overwhelmed with the material and the meticulous nature with which he had researched it and was ready to tell that story that we put the money in and 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 made that show from soups to nuts and then shopped around for uh, a place to display it netflix was the was the um made us the most aggressive uh, the, not just financial offer but they really wanted that show for their platform so we licensed it to them but we obviously took a big gamble there because we could have, you know, it, it, it could have been a, a, had a eight episodes, it turned out to be seven episodes uh, sitting on our hands that, that was worth nothing. But we had, a, we had a belief in the filmmaker and the story, and we also knew the, the voracious appetite of the platforms. Um, you talk about going to festivals, I mean, it, it's, 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 I meet a lot of the, the indie filmmakers here, and man, if I could just get into Martin's festival, it's, you know, that's going to kick me up. And, 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 and it will, and, and we, we still use the festivals. You know, uh, Sky is Pink, for instance, premiered at, at TIFF. Toronto, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's absolutely great for us because it gives us um, publicity, certainly. We didn't need a sale. We already had RSVP was the distributor, but maybe that leads to making, as you said, the gravy of getting some foreign sales. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, for us, we're not looking certainly not as financiers to do that festival strategy model where that'll get me a sales agent and that'll get me a distribution deal. We're, we're, we've done that for many years. The, the, the sort of our, 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 four, four bear, our forefather company did that for 20 years and it was a, it was a it's, it's, it's an interesting business. It, it's not necessarily a good business to be in, at least when you have to answer to investors. So we try to hedge our bets. It's, it's nice being in the other's very savvy business community here, people are very aware, most people of, you know, where they're going to recoup their money, satellite, digital, SVOD, the, the, the music rights are important, theatrical, both uh, domestic and the, the, the very, very large and, and potentially lucrative Indian diaspora market, theatrically and otherwise. Um, so it's great to be able to put an array of, of, of figures down and, and know that, okay, we're in the film business and it's risky and you have to put money at risk and nothing's a sure bet, but you can hedge that bet in, in, in certain ways. And, and I can't underestimate the importance of that diaspora market. There is, you know, I, I, some of the actors, they know exactly how much they are worth in every territory, you know, and whether it's in Malaysia or in Germany or, you know, they're, you know Tamil Nadu or Milan, wherever they're from, they they know what their value is and it, and, and it helps because unfortunately we are in a business and as much as we all are in this, as I said from the get-go, is the art and the storytelling, uh, we do have a, a fiduciary responsibility to our investors to make sure we're making, uh, even if we're taking gambles, they're, they're, they're financially sound gambles. Um, let me just uh, introduce another example in terms of how you can uh, leverage a, a festival. So the, uh, this is a plug unfortunately for a festival I'm involved with, but the Asian World Film Festival in Los Angeles, uh, the mandate is to screen um, films that are submitted out of Asia for Golden Globe and Oscar foreign language categories. So this year we had Gully Boy, um, and uh, the film's done about five million in the United States, which is, is quite a bit, and we had um, 
the director and the producers uh, and Amazon, which are, have the rolled out video rights, um, did a panel with them. We did screenings at, at agencies and really, uh, you know, tried to get behind the film. Um, and, you know, it takes an enormous amount, um, you know, how, you, do you get passionate? Uh, do you go the extra mile? Are there things you do that... Yes, I mean, yeah, sure. Um, I, when you mentioned Gully Boy, I thought it's interesting that, it's, that India is, is a country that it's, it's, um, its Oscar film submission last year was um, Village Rockstars, and this year it's Gully Boy. So, you know, that, that is the, the polar opposites of, of, of culture, polar opposites of situation, production values, all of those things. But those films were both seen as representing Indian cinema, and I think that's terrific. The diversity, I mean, the, the, the NFDC logo is the cinemas of India, which I think is so smart. The S says it all. Um, but yeah, films you care about. Um, I, I, I'll come back to that, Kyoko. Yeah. How do you, yeah. yeah. Which, what makes you passionate? Yeah, and now and then I'm fascinated by Malayalam film. The Malayalam language film that can be the, some kind of the star in the festival circuit in the future. I hope so. So because uh, there are so many creations in the Malayalam language film. And then, the, you know, the, I would like to introduce those kind of the Malayalam film into the Asian film festival, festival in Asia. So because, uh, you know, as I told you, the subject is very close to us, in the family matter, religion matter, and then uh, that's why. And, uh, I prefer in order to introduce the, you know, those kind of religion films personally. So, but uh, for my business, and I would like to introduce the major films and the, you know, to the Japanese audience. So, but there are so many troubles you know, for us to have the deal with the Indian film industry. It's difficult to make the deal? Yeah, very, very. And uh, I, I, it took uh, almost uh, two years to finish the deal with for 2.0. Yeah. Why is that? The film is not completed at all. Yeah, and then, the, you know, the, so also the, you know, the rights are separated recently because of the digital area, era. And then, the, you know, Indian film industry saw the digital rights and the before completing the film. And then, the, you know, we and the Japanese film uh, industry has still have the DVD market. It's the only country who has having the DVD market. And then, the, you know, if the digital uh, rights will be sold into the Japan, and the, the, they will be uh, streaming the, you know, before the, you know, selling the DVD, and it's really trouble for us. And that's why and I have to ask the all the distribution company, please hold back one year at least. And then, the, you know, the Dangal is also like that. And then the, they have already sold to digital, digital platform. And then, the, you know, Jap maybe, I guess, and the Japanese distributor asked them to hold back one year. Oh, um, do you want to jump in again? or Because I have a related yeah, I, question. I, I, Go ahead first. I will super, I'll, I'll try and make it brief. I think the things that, that make me fall in love with a new piece of cinema coming out of India is something that obviously teaches me something new I haven't seen before, which is quite a lot, so there's a sort of benchmark. But also, I'm trying to figure out how it will open up, build my own audience. Um, I'm facing this right now. I want to increase the number of Indian films we have. The, the festival, even though it has 300,000 paid, almost 300,000 paid admissions, which is huge in festival terms, um, we haven't been reaching to our, our a significant Indian uh, migrant population. Um, but also, I want to lift the awareness, I want to train the viewer in New Zealand, um, having them understand there are films that are way outside their comfort zone of what they expect of Indian cinema. And I do feel that there is, in the festival world, a unconscious Orientalist bias towards films that are comfortable, that portray an India that they see as being the India that they're kind of like, which is village stories, which is people fighting to come out of poverty. What people are not necessarily accepting and embracing, and I, I experienced this on the, on the pitching side, taking stories when I worked here, two big festivals that were urban, that were not necessary, that were contemporary, where there may not be poverty, there may be just incredibly intense human stories unfolding. Um, these were less palatable to the Western audience and the Western festival selector audience. So I want to sort of break through some of that. So 
back to what makes me feel excited, is a film that can help me do that, because I want to retrain audiences as well to really broaden the spectrum of what Indian culture, people, cinema is. Um, so, you know, there's not just one India, right? There's 22 languages, uh, and, and each uh, of the 29 states and uh, territories make their own cinema. Um, Hindi, obviously, is, is, is the big one, and then Tamil, Telugu. But how, how, how do the smaller language films break through and get into a festival? Um, Can I answer that? Yes. It doesn't matter. They all, it's all Indian to them. It's true, and I've said this on this, on this platform before, a few years back, and it's sort of, people don't know the difference between, a Western audience, they're really yeah. stupid. They don't know Malayam from, Hindu, from Hindi, from Bengali. Yeah, yeah. It's just an Indian, they yeah. speak Indian. Our audience it's, don't know. Yeah, so it can be a small film from a, you know, a, a tribal community, they don't know the difference. It's just it's, a subtitle film. It's just film, an yeah. Indian <laughs> film that has subtitles. So that's not a problem, I can assure you of that. Now, also, what's everyone's view? I apologize to everyone in the room that Western ears and, and, and understanding of the diversity of Indian culture is so shallow, but that's just the fact of it. Well, it's not just India, I think, from the American point of view, we're equally naive when it comes to every country. So, um, but, so a question, um, what about producing Indian films in English language? Is that a good idea in terms of making your film travel? but a bad idea creatively. Um, what are your views on anyone on, on that? Um, okay, I'll jump right in. I can give you a perfect example uh, of um, a series on Netflix called Sacred Games. Uh, Vikram Chandra's wonderful 1,000 page opus book that was turned into a, a series for Netflix um, starting Saif Sa Sa al-Khan. It's fantastic, and uh, it, that, that is a great example of something that travels outside of India and for uh, audiences in America who, who don't know anything about how engaging, how thrilling, how amazingly captivating these stories can be in another part of the world and be engrossed in it, and also learn about the history of India through a, uh, a crime thriller. Um, it, it not only has an, an educational spin to it, but it also had a dr has a dramatic narrative that you get sucked into, uh, and uh, I think season two already started. But you know, and I didn't know anything about it. You know, as, as you know, curation becomes a big deal on these streaming services, and you never know about anything until somebody tells you about it that you trust and you um, uh, with their with their taste in, in in this kind of stuff. So I think very much so. It's important to to explore that um, and and do um, English language um, content. Okay. Uh, there's a really specific recent example where a film set in Mumbai among kids, quite well to do, upper middle class, middle to upper middle class kids by uh, Mega Ramaswamy, um, that she wanted to be in English language because she was raised in these communities and she spoke English to her friends and it's very, very normal. But there was resistance. It was the, the naturally occurring language of the characters in this milieu, but it was difficult to pitch that because it was, out, again, outside the comfort zone. But Mega, as the maker of that film, chose to do that very specifically, very deliberately, to just open another window, an unexpected window, on a side of India that perhaps Western audiences hadn't seen. Um, what about, let's talk a little bit about co-production. Um, there are plenty of examples of Indian films where you get a co-producer from Holland, from Germany, from France, from Canada, from New Zealand. Um, which, which is great, you know, in terms of the financing schemes. I mean, I think, uh, like... Um, can, can I disagree? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll jump... Uh, I'm sorry. Someone else say something. Creatively, no. probably not no, no, so no, good, I, but I really, go ahead, I, jump I in. I ran a panel in Cannes at, at, the, at, the, um, at the Indian Pavilion some years back, and the title was Co-Producing with India, They Don't Need Your Money. And so it's not about the financial, actually. There's so much money that's available in India to turn to the West where accessing that money can take six to nine months sort of minimum when here you could be on the floor in two months with an undeveloped script or underdeveloped script that happens very often um, there are reasons for co-producing that can be very advantageous one is to um, have access through your co-producers in in europe in particular um, obviously the soft monies they they're helpful but it's access to markets access to film festivals through the relationships they have with 
with selectors, with Cannes, with Berlin, um, the relationships that they have with sales agents is the other key one. So, the, the and the other thing that uh, that I've seen being really big help in co-productions again, while the money is coming through in the much slower Indian, I mean, sorry, European systems. Um, deeper development takes place, and it's a development that takes place with the voice of the Western producer at the table, who is actually helped shape the work, so it's, you know, but those things that might be absolutely obvious to an Indian audience may just be going over the heads of a Western audience, and you can adjust those. So it gives time for those adjustments to, to give a greater chance for the film to work in the Western market. So it's more the ancillary additions than the money, I think, that most co-productions benefit from. I mean, some of the European channels, whether it's ZDF or Arte, or they, they need to invest in these films for cultural uh, quotas that they need for, uh, you know, they need to spend a certain amount on, on, on I think it's just important to know uh, for, for the audience here that, um, you know, it is, is a place to look. Um, yeah. No, 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 it's, it's and, and it, it's a, uh, India, has such an allure, and because of some of the successes, it's, it's much easier to pitch an Indian film into the co-production market in, 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 than from other territories, some other territories. Um, but, the, you know, Arte's involvement in the lunchbox came from the French producer, Chedemia Kola, meeting the project, sitting on the beach in Agonda during the lab, and met Ritesh, and then he had worked with Arte, and Arte came on, and then for the next four or five, six years, um, Remy Bura, who's the head of business affairs at Arte, was always here, swimming in the pool, taking the meetings, sitting on the panel. So a relationship was built through this one successful film, and I'm really sorry I keep talking about the lunchbox. There are also so many others. But it, it just, it, that was, you know, Remy from Arte came here, and he, they were invested in other films, and they, he could have been going to Mongolia. But India has an allure, and it's a currency that you should all be aware of that, you know, it's, you're coming from a great place. There's a lot of affection and love for this place and the stories from here. And what if, does anybody want to comment about the official international co-production treaties? I mean, India has treaties with 14 countries, I believe, including New Zealand and uh, China and, and many in Europe. Um, are there real benefits to that? Is it, is it or is it it's, a political thing? I can be thing? pretty brief. It's super hard without the NFTC in action investing in films at the moment as they haven't been for the last few years because co-production treaties um, rely on the involvement of the national funding body of a country. So the Dutch, the German, the French, they need to engage with the national body. And when the national body is not financing films, it's very difficult for those co-production treaties to be activated. But there's been a call for projects at NFDC for funding. So we're back in action. <laughs> so I just want to talk a little bit about what it's like, again, for foreigners working in India. Um, and, and, and kind of the, the, the whole thing, you know, is it, how is it different uh, creatively? Um, how do you deal with, with the Production. I mean, now you're doing web series, which are usually run on a showrunner concept. Um, you know, different uh, ways the scripts are written and supervised. The budgets are going up. Um, how's that experience been? I mean, uh, it, it seems like with with a market uh, of the size of India, with hundreds of millions of potential customers, everybody wants to be here. Um, and you know, all the American companies certainly want to be here. Um, but more from a producer role. Uh, what are your views on that? Well, first of all, we always team with somebody, no matter where we are, especially in India. You know, um, we've been here probably four or five years, and we're never going to have the same depth of knowledge or relationships, be it business-wise or, or the creative and cultural understanding. So we, we want to partner with other producers in particular uh, who know the distribution landscape, who know the audience taste, etc., and then the storytellers who know about, you know, I can bring a, a piece of IP from somewhere else and it might appeal to the Indian audience once it's, it's adapted and culturalized, but there's such a rich tradition of storytelling here in India, as Martin said, the, the people around the world 
already are sort of keen to hear about. So to, so to be able to, to, to dive into that and, 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 and help these storytellers here tell their stories. And I think what you also part of, point out, Martin, is true, is that, is that they're, they're, the, the quality of filmmaking here is terrific. There's been, you know, a hundred years of good film. Nobody needs anybody to come in from anywhere, let alone the West, and tell them how to make movies and show them how to run a camera and, and, and so But there is a dearth of, 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 of both writing in general and, and, the, and the appreciation for development. And sometimes in the U.S. we overdevelop things, but I think, and this is not just India, but there is a, there is a, a tendency to underdevelop here and put things together and, and get to the floors. As soon as you've got an actor and a director and, and, and an idea and some money, well, we'll be on the floors on Monday and who will write the script, you know, it, it doesn't matter, we'll make it up on the day. I think that's changing, um, especially as the audience taste, and you, and you say about series, Rick, is because that is a new concept here, the way that we've had that in the West for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of, of show running model. And you know you can run around Bombay and people are putting their hands up and saying, oh, I'm a showrunner. I don't even think half those people even know what a showrunner really does. You're the creative force behind a show, but we don't have to get into what the whole definition is. But this is a new concept. And so one of the things we like to bring to the table in, in, in you know, I laugh when you say what's a co-production because there's the official co-production. United States has no co-production trees with any other country, just so you know. So, and I do co-productions all the time. It's just not with a capital C and a capital P. You know, but everything I do, even in the U.S., is a co-production I'm doing with another producer or another or a studio. You know, Crazy Rich Asians we did with Warner Brothers and Color Force. That's a co-production. Um, everything we do here is with a co-production. And in particular, as I said, I'm a foreigner. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guest in the co country here, and we're trying to bring best practices. I think for development, as you said. We have money to spend, but a lot of times people don't want your money. Netflix doesn't want my money, right? Reliance doesn't want my money. Eros doesn't buy a com. They don't want my money because they want to take that money of their own and spend it and put it at risk because then they have the reward, as do we. So sometimes that's a clash. Um, so the soft ancillary value, as you said, of, of the creative, I think, is, is something that we really can help. We, we, we come from a more mature development market where we do appreciate putting the time into getting the stories right before they go on the floors. And that doesn't mean that's right or wrong. It's just a, a, what we think is a best practice. Um, so looking for us to give and then other our producing co-producing partners to give back you know, and help us, again, navigate those waters of how to best reach the, the consumer and navigate those creative waters of, of how best to tell that story locally. Because what works for me in, in LA, or you in New Zealand, or you in, in Tokyo, isn't necessarily gonna work in Pune, or, or, or Hyderabad, or, or Chennai, or wherever else you're making content. And also, it's gonna get, uh, you know, there's never been a better time to be a producer, to echo what you're saying. Um, as a foreign producer trying to come and uh, create content, with your Indian partners because with the it, it's only going to get more with the advent of 5G technology and, and, and higher bandwidth you got to understand that the most of the content here in India is consumed on mobile devices and when once that speed increases you're, you're going to have to jam that pipeline with more content so you can imagine that the, the explosion there uh, when that happens um, furthermore you, you bear in mind that uh, the, the storytelling, this 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 this, con this wonderful country, is a quilt of different ethnicities and religions and peoples and languages. So there are so many ways you can adapt stories and 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 have them apply in uh, different ways. And and I mean the possibilities are endless. So for for a, a foreign producer coming into this market and seeing that the the, the the potential for growth and also the maturation, also the TV penetration, for example, is not as, as great as it should be. I mean, if you and, and, and with a rising middle class in India, you're you're also you can create content for television. So so many avenues to do that with, and so many ways to approach it. Yeah, and I and I would add to that, it, it really is the golden age of storytelling because there are so many. You know, even before we get to all that 5G, just having the Netflix and the Amazons and the hot stars of the world that are buying things, it's a great time to be telling stories and, and being able to put them you know, onto a series or, or, or a movie because there are more buyers. But the flip side of that, again, as it gets bigger, and you write it will, is now, and you mentioned earlier, the curation. There is so much stuff out there, it's actually saturated to what you just did. The budgets have gone up now because all this money's come in and you can't get a DP and you can't find writers because everybody's working, which is, by the way, fantastic. But what's 
going to have to give eventually is that bubble will burst because the curation is going to be, the, the, as usual, the cream will rise to the top. And that's where the development does come in. Yeah, so basically comes. what you're talking about, the, the peak TV or peak content will now, will have to uh, transform itself to something like posh TV or, you know, the m much more elevated uh, level of... Uh, I, I think when the audience is, is, is what you said about curation, you're, 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 gonna, you're not going to know what to watch until someone tells you what to watch it. And thereby, word of mouth has becomes very important. And, then, and, and therefore, your quality of your... Of your, of your of your content is going to become paramount and you're competing now it, it used to be you were competing with your guy across the, the street who's got his theater with his Indian movies now you're competing with everybody who's making any content anywhere in the world because that's what the consumer has the choice now they can go on their laptop and watch a show from Australia a show from Colombia a show from South Africa and so you got to make your content good and the cream will rise to the top Talking about the, the yeah, this, this is, I, I, I'm looking for like the ideal film to lead my sort of Indian programming for my next festival in July, August. And I know it has to be a film that's about to release in July and August. And it has to be the right sort of, a gully boy would be great if Zoya hadn't released it a year ago. Um, this sort of a film, but in terms of the Indian diaspora population seeing the commercial releases day and date legally or illegally, I have no idea how I'm going. I'm, I'm talking to everyone here going like, if you know of a film that has, you know, some decent, wonderful casting that we could like be the lead title for the other more indie and interesting stuff, but it's like the fact that all films are out there and seen day and date, legally or illegally, so is think, a bit of a problem. I think uh, someone's film here could be ready by next July. I think so. July, August, <laughs> anytime that, a okay, couple of stars, need a lead title. That's something to work toward. I, one last thing I wanted to bring up is, is remakes, um, you know, especially Asia. You know, so many fantastic uh, stories come out of different Asian countries, but I'm looking to you right now because I'm thinking about Korea uh, especially and other territories in Asia that, uh, you know, are just riding this bandwidth of, of fantastic remakes that are bought in India, that are bought in the United States, that are bought in Mexico, that are, you know, these stories travel the world. Is that another way? Um, for uh, cultures to come closer together. I mean, yes, the movie, when it's remade, you probably don't know where it came from. But on the other hand, you know, it's, it's the story that came from Korea that all of a sudden is hot in the United States. Um, are you involved at all with um, any uh, uh, remakes or, or, or any of you? I think you might be, right? Um, I might be. I mean, it, it, goes, it goes both ways. I mean, I try to take good stories I see in India that I think might be culturally appropriate in another marketplace and remake it there. But, you know, uh, the guy who is the CEO of Cinepolis, which has an exhibition chain here in India, as you know, uh, fell in love with a movie called Three Idiots that I'm sure you all know and probably saw, and took it to Mexico where Cinepolis is based. Then they made a version of it which was uh, not very good. To, 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 unfortunately, and it just, and I don't know if it's because the concept didn't work or the execution didn't work, but, th you know, that could backfire and kind of like, you know, I, I hope that wouldn't stop them from bringing But if you look at uh, Miss Granny out of Korea, it's been remade, you know, 10 or 15 times in, in you know, every market uh, across Asia and now. Miss Granny? Miss Granny. Yeah, yeah, Miss Granny, which, which, which is, we, we, they just fit Oh Baby down in, 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 in Hyderabad, the Telugu version of it. Um, there's a, a few companies that they have a cottage industry of that's all they do is take Korean content and they just look at everything, you know, there's two Korean movies open a week and they look at them and they say, let's buy the rights and they bring them here and, you know, you're making widgets, there's no, there's no, it's a business more than, more than it's a passion for filmmaking, you know, like every movie that's good doesn't necessarily need to get made in there. Miss Granny is, is very well done and remade it very successfully in a lot of places because it was a good movie and that concept does travel, but that's, that's a unicorn, I think. And, and by the way, that, that's a big thing now, I, IP curation and, and uh, you know, there's funds now that are being set up just to buy a bunch of IPs and they incubate them and cultivate them in the hopes of turning it around and, and selling it. And, down, and I gotta down, tell you, and, and we have done remakes and we can, we'll continue to, of course, and one of the things in my arsenal when I come here, what can I, what can I offer you, the Indian uh, audience or consumer base or, or production uh, company partnerships, one of the things could be IP, but 
the more I come here and the more I meet the filmmakers and the storytellers, why do I want to impose, even if it's a, like a Miss Granny, a good idea, that's fine, but I'd much rather hear your stories and help you make those at a, at a level that they will travel to the rest of the world and we'll get down to Martin's Film Festival because they're truly an Indian story. Yeah, There's I, only seven stories anyway, right? So everything's based on the same I, thing. I think some of the, the this, one of the great strengths of, of the independent space films that are coming out is they are so culturally specific that they couldn't, many could not happen anywhere else um, or very limited spaces in which they, they could be remade as it were. So the cultural uniqueness, something like Love, which is an urban LGBT gay love story set in Mumbai under, at a time where to be gay was illegal and yet these were young men living lives that were actually very out in the open and comfortable with each other. So it, was, it spoke about something very specifically Indian and you couldn't remake that in New York or Amsterdam, what's the point? Um, uh, other stories, um, they have such a cultural specificity that is their strength, I think. He, he doesn't want to mention the lunchbox again because he said he wouldn't, but the, no, I remember It's a really good example, but I I love that. the lunchbox because like this idea of this Tiffin that goes from like, that would never happen in Los Angeles. Like some woman across town from Beverly Hills makes a lunch that I eat in Santa Monica. That's absurd. No, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we are gonna open it up to questions now. Um, so if there are questions, please feel free. Yes, sir, in the front row. Yeah, I think one of the, or, yeah, okay. I think, uh, one of the great advantages of this uh, cross-cultural matrix uh, consisting of Netflix, etc., I suppose would be uh, movies that, for example, would be politically difficult to make in India. You could make them for Netflix. You know, would that be one? I have one such project. <laughs> Did you say that are politically difficult to make yes. in India? Yeah. Well, I think we've all seen that happening. Netflix and Amazon are doing things that, that could not be made even in the commercial space because of censorship or in the public money space because of content. I can so that's already happening. I, I can tell you those days are, are waning. The, the, the idea that I can't make my movie theatrically because it won't be politically accepted, but I can now go to Netflix and Amazon. I think that's your question, right? Because they, yes, those yeah. days are going away. Netflix, they were called up to Delhi a, week, a month ago and met with the RSS. You know, there was not a lot of love for some of the, the most, I'm just, I'm, you can Google it. It's, it's but you, you also bring up an interesting point. Um, is it advisable for, you know, filmmakers to make a deal with Amazon or Netflix uh, up front? Um, you know, where you give up all your rights, but they'll pay for everything? Um, or do you take the gamble of making the film, hoping to get a theatrical release? Uh, and if you don't, an OTT platform will buy it. I mean, to your point, I think they're getting more uh, picky about that now. Oh, there's three or four different questions in there, but going back to your question, they're getting much more picky about the political, that's for sure. Uh, I think if you're a, 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 a newer filmmaker and Netflix or Amazon or Hot Star or Z or anybody wants to pick up your film and you know, yes, you get a little bit of a, of a margin, you give away all rights in perpetuity, I think you should do that deal because you're getting your movie and a lot of people are gonna see your, your, your content because it's gonna go to a lot of people. Uh, for us, we're not as interested in that because we, as I said earlier, we have finances, we wanna put equity in play because we want that upside. Um, but we'll also do, we'll also do those deals too. We, I think a, a balanced portfolio of some things that you've licensed, some things that you own, some things that you try to go theatrically. I wouldn't, the, the idea of, of, of trying to get a theatrical release for your movie without a star is astronomical in India. We made a nice movie we called Ghoul with Radhika Apta, who's a fantastic actress, and we couldn't get a theatrical distribution for that. At the same time, there was another movie made called Pari, with Anushka was in it, and I'm not gonna say one was better than the other, let's just say they're the same. That movie went into theaters. The only difference was one had a star of Anushka, and one had a good actress in Radhika. Uh, the producer, Sumit Bari, probably paid another five, six crores to get her Anushka, and they got a theatrical release. Ours is now a series on Netflix, so it worked all's well that ends well for us, and we have a great relationship with, with the, the, the platform because of that, but the initial plan on that was to have a theatrical release. Um, we could have weathered the storm, I guess, and, and, and you know, taken the loss on, on the movie had it not got eventually picked up at Netflix, but I wouldn't advise anybody to, to, to 
it's tough, you know, what we were saying earlier, you know, it, making a good movie, but please make, go out and make your movie and do it and go to all the festivals and get thing and, 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 and hope you eventually get a sale. But it's, it's a tough road to hoe. You have to, have, you have to have a lot of patience and hopefully some investors who believe in you and are, are not gonna, uh, don't, don't put your own money in, don't bet your house on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the gamble, but. I'd like to add something to that. I think, you know, if you're an indie filmmaker, I mean, you can uh, disagree with me on this or not, but if you're an indie filmmaker and you want to go out there and you want to make your film, I would highly suggest you speak with a sales agent first and get them involved early on in the game because it's becoming increasingly harder to, to sell your, 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 your projects when you, if you're trying to go that old, old route where you're trying to go to the markets and have it sold because if a sales agent's not involved early on and they don't pick out the actors that, are, that, that they know are going to be um, sellable, uh, because they all know each other. I mean, there's just basically a handful to buy and sell amongst themselves, and they need to be involved early on. So my advice to all uh, independent filmmakers out there, take your project early to a sales agent, get them involved, in, because if, if once that train has left the station, you're going to make it a lot harder and, for yourself. And, and just quickly, that's great advice, but I would say do make your movies. Don't take all of our advice or, you know, our best practices. Look at Rima Das and Village Rockstars is a great example. She made that by herself. I don't know if you guys have seen it or you know her, but she's gone around the world twice on that movie. And, and the festival she's, and she got she submitted up for with the Oscar. Bulbul Can Sing, which is an even better film. And, you know, she'd found her audience, the same people who'd seen Village Rockstars. I was at the, her screenings of both of them in Toronto, and people were coming up going, but Miss Das, you've got so much better. What happened? She said, I just learned from the first one. But, you know, those same people who'd said that it, it's, it's an example of if, you know, you create your audience, you have to sustain it by coming up with more work. Just one, one point on festival platforming and sales agents. Um, I, uh, be very careful strategically where you place your film. If you, if you really want and expect to get international sales. I, an example yesterday, I met someone whose film had opened at a very good festival in Europe, but it wasn't an A market platform festival with a market attached. And they were talking to me about sales agents. And I said, very frankly, it's gonna be really tough to get a sales agent because your world premiere has gone to a really great festival, but it's, you, don't, you no longer have it to maybe open in Berlin and the sales agent then has the chance to put it in the European film market or in Cannes with the, with the Cannes Marche or the AFM with, you know, but those, this is a really important thing. Don't be seduced too early. Talk to people who know how to, what sales agents need from you and world premiere is one of the things they most need at an A festival, including Toronto is another good one, by the way. I mean, there's no one, one or two ways to do all tip. this stuff. I mean, there's, 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 multiple, there's a lot of different ways to approach all this. So, uh, like, as you hear from all the different panels, there's always a different angle. Um, and we all come with it through our own lens of experiences and backgrounds in how we approach it. So, as these esteemed panelists to my left and right have told you, you got to trust your own judgment and go with your own gut. I mean, if you have, for example, uh, two or three million followers on, on Instagram and you put your stuff out there, well, guess what? Somebody's going to take a look at that and say, oh my God, you've already got a following. You've got a total addressable market already that is going to follow you no matter what. There's a lot of, I mean, in this day and age, the, the reality of the situation is nobody knows anything. We're all trying to you know, figure out how this is going to move forward as the, the, the confluence uh, of all these things are, are coming into, into head. It used to be an area of, of, of distribution. It was fragmentation. Now it's all about convergence. All these things are converging at such a rapid pace that we can't keep our, our, our heads and minds on it as to where it's all going to be going. We can always project and kind of tell you where we think it's going, but we really don't. I mean, I, at least I don't. I'm not a, uh, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. Sir? Hi. Hello. Hi, I would like to ask this question to uh, Mr. Kaiwan. Uh, when you spoke about the MOU that you signed with the, the Producers Guild of India, you, uh, you, uh, you said that uh, when you notice the synergies and the common denominator and the, and the common denominators between USA and India, so what are the common, what are the common denominators between a country like the US and a country like India, especially when it comes to the 
especially when it comes to the film producers working in those two countries? Very simple, love of stories. We all love storytelling. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, the, the common denominator is always we want to tell a good story. And, and a good story has to have what? And my, my old boss who passed away last week, God rest his soul, um, he used to tell me one thing. The only thing that matters is if your story has a soul. If it has a soul, it will transcend cultural boundaries. It will travel. It will, no matter what language, what every people will gravitate to it. So the common denominator that I'm talking about is finding stories that have a soul, whether you're American, you're Canadian, you're Russian, you're African, you're South American, you're Chinese, Japanese, whatever. That's what I was talking about. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good, e good afternoon, sir. So you all spoke about uh, feature films or films being made in India in English language, Indian films in English language. So uh, my question is, so a lot of them might be, like few of our population might be able to relate to it when they see Indians speaking totally, like through and through in English and being comfortable with it. Not a lot will accept it maybe in India. But as you said, in the West as well, they might be restrained because you, even they aren't used to seeing India being so comfortable with English. And so do you think that is a barrier that can be broken somehow or will it, or is there any plan in the process to break that barrier somehow? I mean, I would just say, um, you know, the, the English language movies that are made that are Indian, quote unquote, you know, with the Patel or Frida Pinto, um, they're Indians out of England, right? The other example I like to use is Crazy Rich Asians, which is a movie with Asians in it, but it really appeals to Asians that grew up in Singapore or the United States or, or England. Um, and that movie did not perform at all in China. Um, nobody went to see it. Uh, it did not do well in India either, but it made well over $200 million in, in other markets. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. That, that's, that's why I asked the question earlier, you know, is an English language movie really an Indian movie or are you making it for the international market and not so much for India? Because I'm guessing a lot of the English language movies uh, that were made that are supposedly Indian did not do well in India. Mm, it's a really tricky question. I think it's, it's almost a cart before the horse thing, I think, trying to figure out whether English language, Indian set films made in English language are going to sell is, I think, going to come along a little bit more slowly behind what's happening with things like Sacred Games being on Netflix and the Netflix and, and Amazonization of Western audiences who are becoming much more used to reading subtitles. I think the audiences are being trained to see not just films in languages that they're not familiar with and read subtitles. They're also, by the level of television rising, they're also seeing, they're reading cinema in ways that they never did before because they'd only been exposed to standard television forms. Television has got so cinematic and it's becoming so internationalized through the, through the big streaming channels that I think, I, I th personally, I, I like films to be in the language of origin and I think I always encourage people to stick to your language of origin. Um, I wouldn't try and solve it by figuring out if we can get audiences to see Indian films in English. I would concentrate more on having audiences be more accepting of language, you know, films that are not in English. That's, also, that's going to be faster as well, I think. Also, you know, the, the, as you were saying, the quality of television is outstanding now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, cinema is now on television. So, I mean, and you can see from the amount of money they're spending on scripted series now. The average cost of a scripted series now runs at uh, $6 million an hour now. $6 million an hour. Uh, and now, you know, you have Apple streaming services and other ones that are spending up to $15, 17000000 million for an hour because they're, they're buying up talent uh, and uh, locking up all these deals with talent. So it's, it's incredible how, how advanced it's becoming. Oh, and just one last thing on that. Of course, the territories that traditionally dub films, like Germany, like France, like Italy, um, they will take an Indian film and they will have their actors 
playing, you know, whoever, Priyanka's voice will do Priyanka's voice. So those territories, are, they're already doing that, so you don't have to do something in, in French or German for them, they do it themselves. Yes, sir, in the front there. Uh, I hear what you're saying about um, stories with soul and good stories and also the importance of going to sales agents. Every sales agent you go to will say, now, which star have you got? Which saleable act have you got? And so whether you have a story with soul or a brilliantly made film or that could be a brilliantly made film, it stops dead because what the sales agent asks for will bust your budget and triple and quadruple your budget which is not the plan. Do you know of any sales agents that have the ability and the confidence in their own sales um, abilities to sell a film that they believe in because it has soul and a good story? Any specific agents? Yep, there's some here, Stray Dogs, Nathan Fish is here, um, Films Boutique, they're not here this year. Um, Sorry, new, new Europe film sales from Poland, uh, most of the French sales agents would not require a star per se because they're entering a film in the art house market. So the, film, the, the sales agents that, that primarily deal in non-English language works right. into the art house market are not afraid of movies without stars. This is invaluable advice. Sir. Can you repeat some of those names just so we can <laughs> register them? Sorry. Stray Dogs, right. Films Boutique. New Europe, um, L Driver, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Celluloid Dreams, Wild Bunch. Wild Bunch. Yeah. The, Thank the, you very much. The continent. But also bear in mind that you know the MGs are going to get on this is just going to be. <laughs> the, well, that's the, the content. Yeah. I mean, some of them are here. Look in the the, the industry guide. will show you which sales, right. which some of them are attending and reg regularly attend the the film bazaar. Thank you very much for that. Great. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. So thank you, uh, Kyoko, Martin, Kayvon, and Killian. This was great. Thank you. Great. And thank you, NFTC and Film Bazaar. Thank you.